Welcome back to Texas T. I'm Roger D, where I bring on hustlers, entrepreneurs, and prodigies for them to tell their stories that have made them find their passion, built their business, or just really been able to crush their industry. And they also give some tips and advice on what can potentially make you guys get to your happy place. And today's guest has a a very, very interesting business that really wasn't there before. I'm sure you guys have heard the term, one man's garbage is another man's treasure. In this case, you replace man with corporations, uh, and they found that corporations in the tech world could really make their products very well, but what they couldn't do is find what to do with those imperfections that ultimately did happen. So they filled that need, and they pretty much created a haven for recycling, taking something that was imperfect and then making it into something that was perfect. So uh, that's a, that's a, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> yeah, man. But uh, but Ben, thanks for coming on. Man. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I know we talked off line a significant a significant amount. Yeah. Uh, dude, if someone's listening right now and they have an industry or they're in something that's like constantly changing and they're like stressing out because they got to they got to go with the tide which you guys have what's your advice to them to keep their head in the game keep them in the pocket and and not go crazy my advice to anybody who is in a business that is constantly changing constantly evolving is to think outside of the box um the walls on the boxes that we that we've built in our minds could be very thick at times and once you think out of them, you see there's a world of opportunities and different ways to maneuver what you're doing. For example, a company that's doing carpet cleaning can today go with, with what's happening today in the world with COVID and all that great stuff, could go and change their business into the sanitation services. They could, again, you could evolve, you can evolve anything you're doing to do something else with it once you get your head out of that box that you've built around it right now i got you it's funny that you say the carpet cleaning and the sanitation i actually had a uh, hector on for htx sanitation solutions he went crazy pivoting he brokered wholesale auto parts yeah and then that died during the pandemic and he just saw a need for sanitation and then and then he filled it yeah so uh, like i said there's the world is constantly evolving and we need to evolve with it yeah, yeah. The best thing to to be able to do when you're in a business that's constantly evolving is to evolve with it. It's kind of in our business we call it dancing to the music or becoming a chameleon. Yeah, you can change colors, change ways anytime you need to because again, not every day is the same. Yeah. Uh, and for you guys at ESR, you found a need that necessarily no one knew they needed yet. How did you guys come across that? Well, the it's it's a lot that has to do with um and sorry could you explain it a little bit because i know sure the the nature of the business is um is taking the trash that corporations build i mean anything from tech world to component level there's going to be waste there's going to be items that came out imperfect um and somebody needs to do something with that and it's come to points where Manufacturers in Mexico have, have overrun their facilities with trash versus actually output. And situations like that, we can come in and, and build and design something that would fit for them in order to take care of what needs to be taken care of. So uh, if it's plastics or metals or, or elements. I was going to say, so you're saying that there's situations that they're manufacturing so much imperfections yep that it's just clogging up the perfection the line yeah yeah that's that's crazy yeah what no. were they doing before uh landfill landfill yeah got you and landfill you and and we we were able to save a fair amount of of landfill space when i say a fair amount we're talking 40 million pounds a year wow yeah that's a lot uh one of our Larger con uh, companies that we work with, I mean, we're doing about eight to ten trailer loads a week. That's crazy. You do the math on that. That's, 
That's a lot. That's a lot. <laughs> so, yeah, we've found the way and, and the know-how of how to turn one thing into another. And that other thing can be reused yeah. or repurposed or recycled in the proper way in order to be rebuilt to something else. Yeah. How did, how did you find these, these companies? How, how did you figure out which ones were at such a terrible waste? Well, the, the thing is you have to go in and look at the different manufacturers of different things. So what is complex? For example, your coffee maker. Yeah. It's got a water heater in it. It's got a screen on it. It's got an opening and closing mechanism. It's got stuff that wears out. And not only stuff that wears out and stuff that's not put together properly, it's, a, it's kind of a once you touch it once, that's it. You can't touch it again. So when those types of items come, come across and they, something needs to be done with them, we find a way of how to recycle it in the most proper way so that all the elements can go back to their feedstock. Yeah. So, for example, the heating elements made out of copper and iron that goes in the copper and iron recycling. The plastic on the outside is made of a certain type of plastic. That can be recycled. The screen can be recycled. The buttons can be recycled because they're a different type of plastic. They'll go to somewhere else. Um, but everything around it can be recycled. And, and, and that's a machine that when they're putting it together, there's going to be some that are not good. Right. And if it's one today or five tomorrow or 20 after a month or a thousand after a year, yeah. something needs to be done with them. And putting them in the landfill is not a good idea because, again, we're, we're using a lot of the land, landfill space and we're contaminating our precious earth. Yeah. And, and you guys are, they're obviously making a benefit as well monetarily for. Of for course. They're, they're saving space and they're, uh, they're actually getting a kickback from, from what guys. we're able to recycle. Yeah. Now, obviously, the coffee maker is a unique item. Yes. And you guys are taking in how many different unique items? Uh, I, I mean, I'd say hundreds, hundreds. thousands. Uh, and everyone has its own, its own different element. Yeah. So what, so when you guys first went, went after the different, different industries, uh, I think we were talking, we were talking about before that you literally had to make processes and machines. To yes. So we went after one specific element um, it was actually a combustible element. It's called uh, tantalum. Tantalum. Yeah, it's one of those weird ones on the periodic table. Um, the element that we were dealing with was combustible. So somebody had to figure out a way how to shred them out of their plastic encasings and make sure they don't catch on fire. Because oh, wow. when one catches on fire, they all catch on fire. This is when you became a chemist? Yes. <laughs> um, so... You know, cracking the shell open, and it, we're talking about pieces that are the size of diamonds. Oh, wow. You have to crack the, the diamond around it and to get to the metal core that's on the inside. Oh, the outside is the size yes. of the diamond. The outside is the size of the diamond. What, what product was this? That, this that specific product that we're talking about is in everything, from these mics to those cameras to the computers everywhere around us. They're everywhere. They're capacitors. Okay. And um, they come in various different shapes and sizes, and they contain that element in it because because that element knows how to retain energy. What's the name of the element again? Tantalum. Tantalum. It knows how to retain energy and disperse it when needed. So um, the mixture of elements that they would put together when manufacturing these capacitors have a so when you tear them out of their plastic yeah. and you hit them like with a hammer or inside of a machine, they'll catch on fire. And when oh. they catch on fire, they'll catch everything around it on fire. Oh, boy. And they don't stop burning until they burn all the oxygen that they have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now how do you solve that problem? You got to think outside of the box. But you say, well, what, you, what if you did it underwater? No, it still catches on fire. What if you... Uh, How does it catch on fire underwater? Oh, because it's got its own oxygen. <laughs> it's, again, like I said, it's one of those elements that are the weird ones. Yeah. And um, so, yeah, it was a huge hurdle. It was a huge, huge hurdle to, to, to overcome. But we figured it out Yeah. Um, by putting it in an atmosphere and, and using different gases. We were able to get it to the point where it cracked open easily, 
because we had it at the super cold temperature. Oh. And we were able to crack it on easily. And not only that, maintain the, our machines because we're running cold and maintain the fact that it doesn't catch on fire because it's an inert gas. Oh. Yeah, and it's doing it cold, so it's not, yeah. it's not there's, no, there's not a lot of friction on it. I got you, I got you. So. Yeah, that's, uh, but yeah, going, going back to that. Uh, so it's all about thinking outside of the box. And today with, with the infrastructure of the internet that we've got, you've, everything is available. Yeah. Everything is available. Just look it up and you'll find it. Yeah. Um, that's how, again, I. so that's just one specific uh, idea that we've gone and, and pursued and moved forward and built and designed and proved and processed for a good amount of years. And then we actually sold the equipment to the company that was producing the actual. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we went from nothing to actually setting up a fortune 500 company with the ability to in-house process all their yeah um their bad capacitors did you uh did you copyright copyright no 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 no, no. it's not copyrighted it's, it's uh, patent pending, patent pending. Yeah, there we no. go. i knew i had the wrong term. no the reason i didn't patent pending is because i actually used pieces of equipment that were designed back in the 70s and had their own patent pending on them uh, but i redesigned that equipment they were old coffee grinders oh. i used old coffee grinders industrial size coffee grinders to to process That's the crazy. uh the material yeah well, and the ironic that we were talking about coffee. yeah and the um when i initially started i mean i was driving a uh i mean i thought it was a big shot so i was driving a bmw and I had a haul behind me, a trailer with this big old shredder on the back of it because <laughs> I needed to do this job. I mean, this, that, that deal actually came to me when I was sitting at my table just like this, and it was about 8 o'clock in the morning. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I had all my equipment for sale. I had the building for sale. I was letting people go. I mean, I was like right at the bottom of the barrel, just like right at the point where I'm like, I'm done. Yeah, I've got nothing left. I'm just ready to move on. Just sell the building and just open a new business and do something else. And then this idea came to me. And the the owner, not the owner of the company, but the 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 procurement manager of the company was in Africa. And he heard my idea as to what I wanted to do in order to process their metal, that, that specific metal. And he was like, okay, I'm going to be on the next flight from Africa to you, to Houston. I was shocked. <laughs> first, first, first phone call. And like, I'm, I'm sitting at the table right now where I've got, you know, I'm, lose, I'm, I'm about to lose everything. And this guy wants to fly from Africa, come see me. I said, come on. Yeah. Sure enough, two days later, the guy was at my desk. We started talking about, you know, refining and, 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 uh, and, the way we're going to process it and all this great stuff. And, and I had no clue what I was going to be doing. I had no clue because I was supposed to deal with some, some other elements that they wanted me to process that, again, I had to be a chemist on a very high level in order to understand what he was talking to me about. But, hey, I, I, like, I faked it till I make that, I guess. Mm -hmm, you yeah. could call it like that. Yeah, yeah. But after he left my office, I could tell you that for a good four or five days straight, I was just on the computer, just researching and, and understanding what I was getting myself into. And come to be the greatest thing that my company has ever done. Yeah. Uh, from that deal, we were able to expand our business into four other locations and, and really pump up our business uh, to the point where it was making good, you know, being able to feed 30 people's families. That's, ama that's amazing. That's the, that's the way I look at it. To me, the success is, is being able to feed other people's families, being able to provide for others. It's not what I've got at home or what I've built for myself. It's what I can provide for everybody around me, for everybody who does for me what needs to be done. Because without them, I couldn't be anything. That's an amazing definition of success. Yeah. I mean, we couldn't, nobody can be successful by themselves. They need others around them to be successful. And to me, again, like the word successful is, is a, from a point to point. I think that it needs to have a different word in order to 
represent what you really want to represent is which is the the feeling that you've got in your heart that every Friday or every time you have to pay your people, you're happy paying your people because you know they've done great work for you and you can keep maintaining what you're doing. So giving someone a life. That's exactly. Like and, and, and being able Giving somebody a purpose and a life to be able for them to go home and provide for their family. Yeah. So, you're, so, so your definition of success is you're creating, you're creating a company that, that not only gives a position to someone, but they're also happy in that position. Yep. And they know that that position is going to be consistent. Exactly. That's that's pretty that's pretty fucking cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> Look, you know, I, when when I hire somebody in my in my business, it, I, the first thing I tell them is, "Look, it's all family here. Everybody who's been working for me has been working for me for longer than I've been alive. Uh, my floor manager has been with us for." 27 years his right hand man's been with him for 23 years uh people in my office are, are their generations that have gone through i've got um uh, my my secretary i've got her daughter and now i'm having uh my floor manager's son come work with us so it's all family down the line and again like i said when somebody works for us they understand it's all family so i mean I, again i can call my people at two o'clock in the morning and we're cool yeah, you get what I'm saying. So because they know there's a reason. There's you know, the, exactly not just because you want to be a hard ass. No, there's no. I there, you can ask anybody who works for me. I'm not a hard ass at all. Yeah, there's there's no reason to be a hard ass. Yeah, you're not gonna get anything better out of anybody by being mean to them or no, by being course. hard on them. Yeah. You're not gonna get anything from them. Yeah, you're yeah. putting more walls up than you are breaking them down. Well, there's an interesting thing that we were talking about before uh, that I think we did capture where you're saying. And you you mentioned that you, you success wasn't defined about what you have. And you had also said that you can get kind of caught up in that material when you start to think that you're better or others are better because of material. Exactly. That means you're starting to treat others who may not have that as less. So Exactly. So in my mind, if if okay. I don't know, but it's, it's gonna be hard to, to Put this together. Hold on a second. Lost my words. You got uh, this. You're always bringing the fire, Ben. Yeah. <laughs> um, if you saw me walking down the street with a big old gold chain on me and, and a big blingy watch on me, and a, I mean, I've got a big massive ring on me, but other than that, I'm saying, if you saw me really bling and driving a beautiful car and all my other employees were driving shitty cars. Yeah. And my office is look like hell but i look like a million dollars what would you say about my company i would say that well i would I, well the it's, first, a, it's an owner hungry that I, yeah it's an owner hungry company i was gonna say the first thing i was gonna say was the comment wouldn't be about the business it would be about you <laughs> exactly so i when when some people see me i want them to see my business along with it you see me i'm a plain jane type of guy mm -hmm. that's all i am and that's what my business is also. It's plain Jane. It's, it's a, we're not up here. We're not down there. But we're right there with everybody else. We look at everybody at eye level. Consistency. Yep. No, yeah. well, I, consistency is a word, but it's not consistency. It's more of eye level. Everybody, everybody's on the same plane. Got you. Nobody's above anybody and nobody's below oh, anybody. You're saying who's working there. Yeah. Well, not only who's working there, but the way we treat other our counterparts everybody that that we work with or everybody that we that we procure from we treat everybody eye level nobody's better than us and we're not better than anybody else yeah it's actually funny uh it's clicking for me now because i remember when i originally was was talking with you all uh at the very beginning when yesi answered my call yeah when i was cold calling uh, trying to find who was gonna make the decision, I felt I was like I was like, who is the boss here? <laughs> it was like, there is no boss. I see. That's the thing. We 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 let everybody make the decisions. We, so, for example, when it comes to 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 our power bill, I'm caught up in doing whatever I gotta be doing. Yeah. Uh, my brother's caught up in doing whatever he's gotta be doing. Everybody else is doing whatever they they gotta be doing. Somebody who's got a free minute. Hey, look at all these numbers here. Tell me what works best. Yeah. Let's move on with that. Yeah. I don't, if I, if I was to make all the decisions in the, in the, uh, in the office, I would be 
I mean, nobody would have time to sit down and talk to me about if they had an issue or anything like that, or I wouldn't have time to to think about other things. So delegation is a big is a big yeah. uh, is a big thing in in op- entrepreneurship. Because if you're bottlenecking the decisions, you probably wouldn't have been able to sit there for hours researching on the exactly. computer to find the to find the thing that was going to save everything. Exactly. How how long was ESR around, by the way, uh, before that situation came about? A uh, good seventeen years, sixteen wow. years. Yeah. And and I asked that because it's and the reason that that happened is because um, when I was eighteen, we we all packed our things and moved over to Israel because I wanted to go serve in the army. Um, so my dad packed up the house here, and we said, you know what, we'll leave everything with our managers there, mm-hmm. and once every few months we'll. Travel back, see what's going on. Everything is okay. Come back. But there's a uh, there's a saying in Hebrew, and I don't know how it translates in English. But if the owner of the farm's not there, the cow's not milking. <sighs> you get that? Yeah. You get that sentence? Yeah. So what's the uh, what's the Hebrew? Well, it, it's a, it's the same thing, but okay. it, uh, it it basically comes and says like, look, if the owner's not there and there's nobody actually there to look at everything and to to show face then you're not going to get the most out of your out of your business. Mm. And that was the case. I mean, we for 3 years we kind of left the business to do its own thing. And after 3 years we came back and it it's not like we were sunken in debt, but we just didn't have any clients. We didn't have any procurements. We didn't have anything kind of rolling. Mm. Um and that was a funny story. When I first came to the business, we had a situation where uh, somebody went into a company that we were working with, and under our name, sent out a few trucks of stolen goods to a different location. Oh man! And we had a you know huge court case and all that great stuff. But I mean, this is probably about three months of me working in the co- company after I got out of the army, and I've got FBI and and oh, uh, and. Um, investigators at my door yeah how do you how do you keep your head when you have so that's i i didn't have anything that crazy uh, we, we caught a situation of potential fraud way early didn't have to worry about any of it but um i mean didn't have to worry about the extent of, of yeah. what would happen if it went through right but um i always wondered how when i see these these documentaries of bigger companies that are getting investigated how, how do you keep your head when you have the feds at the door, so the because we're a transparent company, yeah, and because I know that I don't do anything wrong, I know how I know I can sleep at night good, yeah. And I don't know if anybody wants to come and knock on my door and wants to say something. You're more than welcome to, and we could talk about it and we could figure out what happened. But just so you know, I'm here with you. Mm. We're together. Let's do this. That's the way you keep your head in the game. Right. You're if you've got nothing to worry about because you did everything you're supposed to do the right way. Full. I mean, take the take the people's numbers. I mean, take the 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 officers' numbers or the investigators' numbers or whatever it might be, and call them on a daily basis and say, "Hey, where are yeah. we? What's going on? How can I help? How can I put a hand in this in order to make sure that I'm not, you know, yeah. that that everything is going the way it needs to be going." The more involved you are, the better off for you. The right. less involved you are, the more conspiracies and the more um, ideas are going to come up. And there's not going to be anybody there to say, hey, wait, no, 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 that's not what happened. Or, right. hey, wait, I've got ways to prove it otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very interesting situation. See, most people would want to kind of distance themselves, say, oh, maybe it's going to pass yeah. by. Maybe, yeah, just distance themselves as much as possible. Yeah. No, I'm the more type of guy that says, hey, Let's try to figure this out together. Yeah. And that's what we did. We, you know, with the whole situation with that, I mean, I, we actually went and called up the office. Uh, we called up the warehouse. We figured out who were the trucking drivers were. We figured out this, that. We got it all straightened out the same day. The second that you let problems roll over the next days, it, it, they, they start stretching out. Mm. And the hard, the more they stretch out, the harder it is to bundle it back together. Yeah, and the more gaps there is, and the, the more gaps, the more the more missing information. Yeah, got you. So that situation, for example, I had them there from eight o'clock in the morning. By three o'clock, the FBI agents 
and the investigators, both of them shook my hand, said, thank you very much for your time. We have nothing to look for here. We appreciate your business, and you'll have more trucks coming from our company for destruction uh, later oh, wow. on. Yeah, because you proved to us that you guys have nothing to hide. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. And that was the that was the, the the gist of it. That's awesome. Yeah. So hitting so hitting the the problem, um, hitting first, the nail on the head. Yeah. Is yeah is the only way to go. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I think a lot of and that was just kind of a random thought, but I think a lot of people think that whenever there's an investigation, they're assuming you're guilty. So you. Yeah. No. To... They're, they're, I've had so we work with a lot of different entities that involve the government, and I've had variety of different um agencies mm-hmm. at my office and, and when you when you understand what they want and what they're looking for and how to adjust the problem and what the maximum penalty is for not doing what you're doing correctly mm-hmm. then you kind of put everything in proportion and once you have things in proportion you could put them in their own little bubble and put that proportion aside then move on to whatever else you need to do. But make sure that you do what you got to do to handle the situation that you've got at hand. Yeah. The longer you let a situation fall out, the harder it is to put it back together. Yeah. As you were saying, the further it stretches out, the worse yeah. they work. It's like having a, it's like having a, a, you know, a pissed off customer. If you fix the problem the same right day... If you fix the problem the same day, the same moment that it happened, or, or within you know the few hours that that it happened, you can you can melt the problem away. Yep. yep. For example, uh, AT and T. I've got a I, I've got a a line with them, and we're c- cutting in and out, and I've got an issue with them. If they tell you the same day, hey, we'll cancel your your bill for the whole month. You'd be the happiest camper in the world, right? Yeah. Your your, your internet cut out for twenty four hours. They told you you don't have to pay your bill for the whole month. That's great. I'm not going to call and complain, are you? No. <laughs> you see? Yeah. So it's, it's solving the issue, even if it takes a little bit more out of you, solving it on spot, make sure you don't have a problem for tomorrow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that you can go to sleep at night with a clear mind, knowing that everything is cool. Yeah, yeah. That's and, it. And if you can't, and this is a, I love that topic because uh, sometimes uh, in our industry, you can't, always solve the problem exactly that day because we have to rely on the TDSP. We have to rely on center point. Yeah. Uh, I found that a lot of agents or a lot of people in this industry, which for the weirdest reason are almost scared to pick up the call when they know there's a problem. But I think that's probably just human nature. Well, I mean, no, I mean, look, I think that for example, as a, as a electricity provider let's say that my power got cut off because i forgot to update my credit card or whatever it might be blah 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 my power got shut off you know what would make me feel better if for example i called up the power the company that's providing me with electricity if they were three me way three way me in with center point and say hey center point our customer paid so can you make sure that you guys get us reconnected and make sure that this take, gets taken care of or tell us where we are on, on the schedule of getting reconnected, that would make any customer feel better. Yeah, yeah. That's, I mean, that would be like the number one problem solver right there. So sadly... I know, sadly, possible. because of the corporations, because of the way that the things are structured, you can't do that. But what, but what you can do, I always try to figure out what's the most we can do. Yeah. And it's over-communication. At this point, it's hey, and, and timetabling it. Hey, look, okay, cool. We updated the credit card situation, so now we got it paid. Uh, I've just submitted it to be to be picked back up by Centerpoint. Okay, cool. Let's. I'm going to call in a half hour to make sure that Centerpoint has the order and, and they're processing it. I'm going to call you in another hour to let you know what the ETA is on that. Yeah. So you you, you get what I'm saying, but yeah. it's when you put a times table or when you, you when you communication is key. Yeah. Communication, communication, communication. That's the number one thing. And any company that I work with or anybody that I that I do business with, they're all on my phone. Yeah, I can call each and every one of them up right now and and you know say hi, how are you doing? Happy Thanksgiving. Yeah, that's it. And it, that's the type of relationship you want to build with all your customers. Of course, of course, all of them, from small ones to ginormous ones. Treat everyone the same. Treat everyone the same. 
Yeah. Exactly. That's what. That's how I feel about the whole industry, about everything in the world. I mean, that's that's how I see everybody. Yeah. Treat everybody the same way. Yeah. Now, obviously, a smaller problem that maybe you can fix in a day is, is a thing, and you want You want to, you know, under promise, over deliver, as always. Yeah. When you guys are. When you guys are getting something... When you under-promise, over-deliver, I've got a problem with that phrase. Okay. Under-promise, over-deliver. Sometimes over-delivering, when unexpected, feels like you've got a grasp of somebody. Ah, okay. Let me give you an example. You're at a restaurant. You order yourself a plate of pasta, for example. You get the plate of pasta, and next to it you get a salad, and you get bread, and you get... Uh, you know, a fine glass of wine. That's over delivering, right? Yeah. But what are you thinking in the back much. of your head? You're like, wait a minute, am I gonna have to pay for this? It's this uh, is this gonna screw me over at the end? Or is this pasta just not all that great because I gotta eat the salad and I gotta eat the bread? You understand the, the thought process? You gotta you thinking inside the box says yes, over promising under I mean um under promising over delivering is the right way to think in that box. Think you take yourself out of that box. Nobody ever nobody thinks the same. Yeah. Everybody thinks it's a different way. Yeah, yeah. So if you are going to do something that way, you need to make sure that you have an explanation why something that they weren't expecting happened. Yeah. Got you. So yeah. if they come, if they come out with the, you know, the extra salad, the extra glass of wine. This is from this is a compliment from the chef. I would feel bazillion times better. Right. Right. Exactly. exactly. You know what I mean? So back to over communication. Yeah. <laughs> always, always having a reason behind everything. Yeah. Uh, so, so. You are you guys are getting new products to deconstruct. And We're getting new product, old product, product, used product, broken product, right. smashed product, uh, product that that were for displays, for example. Yeah. We're getting everything under the sun. Right, and and all what and, I was no, uh, go going to ask was, yeah. regardless of what that is, you, a lot of the times you have to figure out what the process is going to be. And in a situation where someone says like, Hey, can you do this? And you say, yes, we can do this. How do you, how do you manage expectation when you have to com- create a completely new process? So money is the driver for everything, right? We, okay. I'll give an example. There's a company called uh, satellite tracking people. Okay. They're a company here in Houston. They're also entrepreneurs. Yeah. Uh, they made the leg, ang- the ankle monitor. Okay. Their ankle monitors are used all across the nation. Very clear, explained name. <laughs> yeah. Uh, they needed to figure out a way how to crack open the shell uh-huh. and replace the battery inside so that they could put a new battery inside or replace whatever needs to be replaced so that they can reuse the product that they've made. Mm-hmm. They made a very great product. It's very durable. It's really good. Problem is that when they fuse the two shells together because they don't want to be tampered with, they're fused. They're 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 as one. They had to figure out a way how to cut all the way around it. We figured out a way to how to cut all all the way around it with a hot wire, all that great stuff. Problem being is, they are. Well, it's it's more of a situation where they've got an easier way to do it right now, and they want to stick to that way. Which is fine, but my research and development didn't take me more than I don't know, a week. Mm-hmm. So it's okay. Sometimes you invest time and money into things that don't end up being the greatest, but it's a learning curve. Mm. So from that learning curve, we learned that there's other in, there's other industries that need that hot wire in order to be able to cut around their plastic shell in order to get the element that they have inside. For example, there's uh, there's a fish finder that is like a ball, you throw it in the water and on a string and it tells you if there's fish in the water, right? Mm -hmm. Those are also fused together, but that's a lot more, that's a, that's a much more interesting product. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they've got a lot more of them. They produce a lot more of them. Now there's a lot and the, when they're bad, they're really bad. You can't reuse them, but you got to figure out a way how to recycle this. Mm -hmm. So now we figured out a way, use the hot wire, Put it in the machine. It cracks it open. We get this. We get the uh, the board out of the inside. So you find these opportunities, and you're not sure if it's going to be completely lucrative, but you're willing to put in the money 
you're willing to put in the the minimal effort right. and and money and time to see what what where this could go. Mm-hmm. It's like um, it's like it's like playing poker. Yeah, you've got eh, you got a hand that could work. Are you willing to put you know get in the game and play this out? If it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. You don't have to put all your chips in. Yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying. So you you manage the expectation as you're doing something and, and there, there's a risk fact. You already know there's a risk that it's not going to work out, but you know for a fact, no matter what, you're going to learn from it. Exactly. And then you can take that to the, to the next one. How did, you, how did you guys, how did you do that ankle break bracelet and then say, wait, let's go do this over here? Like, is it just- Because we found, we found out that, that they don't have a need as much as they thought they had a need or- what? It no, didn't sorry. necessarily like work for them the right. way they wanted it to work for them. So we kind of just said, you know what? We could take, I could take this little thing that I made here and let's see what other applications we could do with it. So you started shopping it out. Yeah. You start, like, you start finding cool. a need for your right. research or for, your, for what you've done. You start finding the need for it later yeah. on in the line. So you guys are just con- continually innovating on a... Yeah, on, on a very quick basis. Exactly. Gosh, you it's just like the uh, like the copper chopping line that we did. Mm-hmm. We understood that there was a need. We understood that there's a there's a, definitely a need for mm-hmm. for somebody to chop up the the low end wires. Are we the right people to do it? Maybe not, but we did definitely learn, and we we took what we learned and implemented it to other things, mm-hmm. to other um, elements. So it's just, no pun intended, recycling <laughs> what, yeah. what you've already figured out. What exactly. You've, what you've already figured out. Um, how do you, uh, uh, because, you're, you're work, because on the other end, the, the customer came to you with a problem and they wanted, wanted uh, something to happen. Have you ever run into a situation where uh, you've, you've come with this prototype and uh the 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 company wants to continue to try to find something with you guys uh how 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 do you have the hard conversation to say hey look at this point you're going to have to you're going to have to put some skin in the game is there ever a time where you have you let them know that like look this is going to cost us too much to figure it out well yes well i've uh, <laughs> i've got a situation on my hands right now um I've got somebody that does a very, very unique type of plating, and uh, they're plating with a very, very expensive metal. Mm-hmm. Now, to get the metal tested through the equipment that I have, I could test it all day, any day. Mm-hmm. They feel that it's inaccurate the way that I'm testing it, and they want it tested by a third-party vendor. So at this point, I'm kind of like, it's going to cost me a little bit, but are you going to work with me? Mm-hmm. If you work with me, I don't mind putting up the putting up the money to to do it. Right. I don't mind put. I don't mind because this is something that I've done in the past, and I'm confident in what I do. That it's sending it out to a third party, I don't mind it unless. But but let's send a good sample of it because the sample that you gave me is all, is what you feel is a good sample of it. But when I, when I want to take my own sample out of it and send it off to a lab. Not just what you give me. Mm-hmm. So there's situations where, like, yes, there's you have to tell people, look, it's going to cost money to do this, mm-hmm. and don't be shy to say that because it is what it is. Mm-hmm. Everybody needs to eat at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's there's cool. some chutzpah you have to put with everything, but look, everybody's got to eat. Yeah, you yeah. know, you can't just work for free. Yeah, yeah. So. But, but be up front and forward. Yeah, be up front. Be, don't come hit them with the bill at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? No, over-delivering the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, the, ex, the, ex, the extra bill. Yeah. So, so you guys, it seems that you're always, because it's so shifting and changing, you, you, every, op, every opportunity, is, it seems there's, it's completely different. Every opportunity is completely different. Yes. Is, is there any is there any trend that you've seen just in general as a as a business owner as as running ESR? Uh, re- even though 
there's it's Klein is each a unique entity and has a unique product that they're bringing in. What do you, what do you feel like is something that no matter what the process was, you 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 refined a, a certain skill that really kind of helped you to negotiate. So it's not the skill to negotiate, more like it's the skill to find a niche. Okay. The people who made this table, yeah, knew that there's a there's a uniqueness to it. Mm-hmm. It's not just another table that's just got a wood slab on top of it and called it a table. Mm-hmm. They put these nice corners on it. They put the little screws in it. They, put the, they made the base for it. They, f- they knew that somebody's going to come out and, and get one of these mm-hmm. because there's a niche market for them. Mm-hmm. There's a niche for everything. Mm-hmm. And you just have to find the one that nobody's found yet. So, so, the, so the most... The way that I find my people... The way that I find what to do or how to procure or which way to go with it is by going to places who, that haven't been visited yet. Mm-hmm. So there's, there's a million and one different recycling companies in the world. Everybody's gone and knocked on Sony's door. Everybody's gone and knocked on Dell's door. Everybody's gone and knocked on you know, the bigger corporations' doors to try and get their product because you know, they're huge manufacturers. But what about the small people? What about the little companies that make, for example, I don't know, the, uh, the hearing aid? Hmm. They're a small company. They're a small manufacturer. They're not going to have a huge amount of volume. But if you find one, two, three, four, five, six, ten of them, fifteen of them, mm-hmm. then you suddenly start getting a collection of product that you can start processing and doing things with. Yeah. Um, and that's the way I look at it. If look, focus on the small ones, not, not on the huge ones. So, so figure out what you're good at. It's kind of like we spoke about, you know, if, if I was to come to the city of Houston and say, I, I want to build a, a solar farm for you guys, I'd have to build huge in order yeah. to accumulate, to, yeah. to accommodate all this power that needs. And there's definitely already people talking to them. Yeah, there's definitely already people talking to them. But if you go out to the small city like Patterson or, or whatever it might be, just a tiny little hole in you know hole in the map cities Mm -hmm. there might be a good manufacturer there that needs power and he wants to have green power so that you could trickle that down so that when they come and sit down at their um board meeting they can come and say hey we're running on 100 percent renewable energy yeah that's a huge sticker they could put on their uh on their product yeah so in essence uh you either find a niche industry that's under like literally it's something that is new or underserved or new or underserved. Yeah. Or if you're in a bigger industry, you try to find the the niche customer. Exactly. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so after all the uh, negotiations and working with clients that you've had, uh, that was just you, you doubling down more on more of, okay, I need to find the next unique customer. Exactly. So, so keep keeping it unique. Um, well, Ben, I think that's actually a pretty natural <laughs> way, way to stop. Yeah. Uh, is there, uh, is there any like additional thing? Cause there's, there's, there's obviously people that are completely lost, uh, but they want to get into something. What would you, what would you say to them? I would say to them, build the whole business in your mind, hmm. build the whole thing, everything from the tables to the chairs that you're going to put down, build it all in your mind. After that, put it on paper. After that, start going out and figuring out what it's all going to cost you. After you've done all that, look at it again and see if it'll actually make money. If it does, go for it. If it doesn't, move on to the next. Yeah. And don't be afraid to put your foot through the door because, I mean, that's the only way you're going to be able to, to do something with it. Yeah. It's just like you went and invested in buying a mic and a stand and all that great stuff even though you need one with anything. <laughs> I need new ones, but it's all good. Yeah, uh, I do. <laughs> but you you went and, and made the initial investment because you wanted to try and, and do this. Yeah. Everybody needs to, to try and do the, the, the minimum and to try to get the maximum out of it. It's actually funny that you say that because I actually started with my iPhone, uh, a $15 stand, $15 or $20 stand, and I think it was like 40 or $50 lapels. So I kept everything under 100 Yep, and uh, I gave it a shot, and then once I realized, okay, maybe this is a thing, you know, 
more than three people were like, okay, I'll come on your show. I was like, okay, I don't suck at this. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's try to figure it out. Yeah. Well, no, nah, that's good. That's, that's good advice. Thanks for coming on, Ben. Absolutely. Um, I know you guys aren't super uh, out in the web, but. No, uh, we're not. We're, we're, again, like I said, niche. Niche. Uh, ESR inc.com yep. uh, and then uh, of course if you want to roll up 6427 Springer Road yeah uh, beautiful building yeah <laughs> absolutely beautiful absolutely beautiful building been there m- multiple times um, but but yeah uh, thanks for coming on man I, I really enjoyed that story I uh, really in- in- enjoyed learning uh, how to find a way to get everything done it seems you yeah just- <laughs> But focus. yeah, just fo- focus on the, the task at hand. Yeah. Uh, if you have any questions for Ben, obviously shoot them in the comments below. Uh, you can find Texas T on a YouTube, of course, Texas T podcast. And then all our ats are at TXT podcast, Instagram, uh, TikTok, Facebook. And uh, we're going to be t- TXT podcast.com eventually. So uh, any questions you have for us? Uh, anyone you want to have us bring on, we'd be more than happy to. Uh, and, uh, and remember the tea tastes the sweetest when it's coming from Texas. So thanks. Thanks for coming on, man. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you.